Garrett McQueen. I'm Scott Blankenship. <laughs> and this is Triloquy, true and real stories from the fringes of classical music. Feeling feeling a little goofy today. Feeling what? a little uplifted today, I'll say. Why do you think that is? I don't know, just like the, the weather is feeling good and, uh, you know, still listening to, uh, you know, what Beyonce blessed us with so long ago. And <laughs> oh, homecoming, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was phenomenal. Such a great experience. Well, we'll have to talk about that really in depth uh, sometime. But if I can say anything about it now, it's just how significant it is to see that black HBCU um, experience put through the through the machine of of Beyonce's pop music, it's it's, it's incredible. What it, it, she you know she's going to be up there with Copeland and and I would even say Mozart and all those people. You know when oh, the history so. books are written in the in the coming years. I mean, who was a better performer? And you can you can bring up Michael Jackson, um, but that's that's really the only person. And this isn't a, a conversation about music. Who's the best musician? But who is really just putting on a show that is getting everyone's attention? And it's her. And she did that twice, two different nights. Yeah. And they splice them together seamlessly. Yeah. Yeah. So she was, you know, being in control of where each camera is and, you know, where each dancer is and each, you know, just that that attention to detail that we um, that, that we boast up classical music for so much. But but even greater, because if you listen to these recordings, these are definitely recordings. These are not you know, there are some really phenomenal live recordings of classical pieces of music. Mm-hmm. But most of the stuff we air, you know, happened in the studio. Happened, with, yeah. with cut and paste and band-aids and all that sort of thing and and she uh wasn't doing any of that so yeah it's really phenomenal why are you grabbing my phone scott uh, because every time you get a text you can hear chirp through the line you can hear that oh no one's texting me so what do you think that is <laughs> is you, you're the popular one getting, <laughs> getting all these texts and chirps and 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 what do they call tinder tweets or whatever i don't know it's been a little while for me mm-hmm. how's that going by the way um, I'm, I'm, I've started a, a new plan. I'm on a, okay. I'm on a new plan. <laughs> uh, it's called the let yourself go plan. Um, there, uh, I'm going to start eating a lot of empty calories, a lot of fried foods. Okay. Um, w- the little bit of exercise that I'm getting, I'm going to cut that out and, and see what, just see what happens. Yeah. Well, I can help you out with the fried food, as uh, as as could my dear friend Pete, who is featured on this opus of Triloquy. Yeah, is he a cook too? He taught me how to do the uh, Bananas Foster that you had at my place that time. Actually. Oh, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. And set the alarm off and everything so yeah. you know it was right. Yeah. And I actually made the Bananas Foster last time uh, Pete was uh, Pete was uh, here in the Twin Cities visiting, took us to Paisley Park. And yeah, I gained a couple pounds that day myself. <laughs> let's talk. Uh, let's <laughs> talk about your conversation with Pete and your background. How did you first come in contact with Pete? Yeah. So, uh Middle school, high school band, you know, comes with, uh, you know, solo and ensemble and honor band and all that sort of, you know, sort of inter inter school things. So Pete was uh, one of those trombone players that I had heard of and uh, and respected to a degree because he was, you know, knocking out first chairs at all these auditions and stuff. So he was just, you know, Pete Collin was kind of or Petey Collin, as we called him back then. Um, you know, he was just kind of a name in in the in the band geek circles. And, um, you know, when I uh, when I got up into college, I started teaching band camp uh, at his alma mater. And I actually met him there. He uh, he he joined the the band camp team, too, and eventually transferred from a school in Middle Tennessee uh, back to the University of Memphis. So, you know, that's when we really started um, hanging out a lot. And yeah, he's he's still a great friend of mine. Every every time I go to New York, uh, I make a point to go hang out with him. Uh, as I mentioned, he's already been here to the Twin Cities. Um, yeah, looking forward to seeing Pete again. Shout out, huge shout out to Pete. Really, really great guy. Listening to you guys talk, I was struck by, um, he's got a, a like almost a call to education. Yeah. You know, he spent a lot of time educating. Comes from a long line of educators. And then left that 
to go and be a lawyer. Yeah. And, you know, that that just makes me think about something I've been thinking about a lot lately is, you know, career evolution. And, you know, we all, you know, everyone that's a radio host here on the classical team at uh, at APM can definitely speak to that because I, you know, began, of course, on the stage. You began on the stage, yeah. a different type of stage, yep. uh, you know, and and here we are. And it doesn't mean we don't love where we came from. I, you know, my justification is that I love it so much. I needed a bigger platform to share my love for it. And, and radio is is just what that is for me. And, and for Pete, you know, um, his evolution led him to, to law. Uh, one of the things that he talked about was um, you go to a competition that might be on the other side of the state. Yeah. And then you and the kids got to come back and, you know, be ready to do something else the next day. Right. And it sounds like they're running on little sleep. The stakes are high. Is it any wonder why people are leaving this profession to go off and do other things? Well, you know, it, th- that's hard for me to speak to because I've, I've never worked as a full time teacher, you mm-hmm. know, like that. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people are in it for the for the long haul. You know, in our conversation, he mentions uh, Barry Trowball and, and Gary Fight. You know, they're the other band directors at this school that he went to and went back to teach at. Yeah. And, you know, they're um, you know, they're 30 something years in, you know, they're or, or 20 something years in. I, they're 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 both very close to that retirement mark. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of people who you know, are really dedicated to that. But you also have to, um, you know, factor in, you know, do I want to raise a family? Do I want to live in this community that I know? Because Gary Fight, again, who's one of these band directors, he also went to Munford High School. So he's he's teaching at his alma mater and living in the the small town he grew up in. So there's just a lot of things that, that go into that. And for them, you know, it's, I, I think that all you know, melts down into why they've decided to stay. Now, some teachers at different schools, you know, or, or wherever, you know, those those circumstances are the same. I dated a teacher for um, for many, many years. And uh, and, you know, he stuck to his school because he really liked his administration. So, you know, there there are a lot of different factors that go into that thing. I think this is one of the things that irritates me. No end is those uh, it are people that say, well, teachers, why why do they need to make more money? They get summers off, you know, and the, it's an easy job and all of this. And then you hear stories like his yeah. where, you know, where do you have time to go on a date? Right. You know, he's talking about his life work balance. And not only is uh, a music program in a school setting up kids to be successful in life, what with, you know, uh, uh, following practice, you know, practicing until you can't do it any other way than perfect. Yeah. One of the things that he said in your interview that I was really struck by, I want to play that clip right now. It's not just in the concert hall. It's this whole concept of marching band, this outdoor performance ensemble, bringing this, you know, convention of highbrow classical music to sports crowds and people who otherwise are never going to set foot in the concert hall. So what does that make you think about? See, the the fact that I never thought of it from that angle hmm. is that the people in the stands, this is going to be their exposure to, like he said, they might quote Copeland in a in a in a band piece or some Stravinsky. Yeah, that is going to be their exposure, and it's as valid. As sitting in that concert hall, I think that's the other step that classical music professionals and the classical music industry needs to get over is that 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 man holding a beer that he snuck into the into the football stands, listening to the band play X, Y and Z. You know, that experience is as valid and as musical as any other, because it all comes from that same classical training, that classic training of music. Yeah, I I that was really uh, just a, a direction that. I hadn't thought of as far as being a teacher and the role that music plays in the high school process coming right. up for kids. And, you know, another thing uh, Pete talked about in our conversation is, you know, I, I basically asked him about, you know, the highs and lows of being a musician versus uh, being a lawyer as he is now. And, you know, he talks about as a musician, the the highs are always going to be higher, but 
you know, the lows are always going to be lower. And, yeah. you know, when he said that, it uh, it reminded me of something. You know, I was fresh out of grad school and I had a contract um, set up with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. You know, so I, I had a, a gig to go to come September. But um, the principal bassoon position of the Memphis Symphony opened up and I was like, oh, well, this is just poetic justice. You know, I you know, I'm done with grad school just in time for this audition in my hometown. And yeah. um and I went to the audition, and I advanced and everything. I did well. Uh, I actually <laughs> beat my former teacher at that audition. Shout out to Lacolian. Uh-oh. Um, but, you know, I didn't make it all the way through. And, you know, all of the months, all of the time that goes into that preparation alongside, you know, the the ideas you have of you living back in your hometown, doing exactly what you want to do, you know, me having to get in, pack up my bassoon, get back in my car, and drive to the um, to the part time job I had that summer as an overnight taxi dispatcher. You know mm. that was a low. That was very much a low. So um, so I understand what Pete is saying there. And if there's any point I want everyone to understand about this conversation is that um, I'm not or Pete. Neither of us are advocating for walking away from your passion for the sake of money. But you just have to acknowledge how that passion fits into the uh, into the pragmatism of, of your own life. And for Pete, it was transitioning um, into being a lawyer and teaching music, you know, um, on the side. And, and you know, for me, it, it was leaving the stage um, and getting the grand opportunity to talk about classical music over a, a national audience. I'm, I'm sure you can speak to, you know, your... Um, the sacrifices you made both artistically and pragmatically to figure out what your career looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I had just hit a point where it was obvious that I had gone about as far as I could go. It would have been an austere existence, shall we say. Yeah. You know, there wasn't a, a whole lot of money because I'm, when I moved here, I was essentially doing four part time jobs to try to make it. And I was still struggling. You right. Know? You still wasn't driving the Maserati. Mm -mm, no. Uh, the, I was in no danger of that. Um, not to mention the fact that I had never lived outside of my hometown. So I was leaving oh, wow. friends and family. Uh, I really believe that it was the right decision in that I think I, I'm not, I was an adult beforehand, but I matured after the move. Because when you're in a position where there's nobody around for you to lean on, uh, or if you get in trouble, and there's nobody around to help, you got to figure it out. You so know, you have to do it on your own. Wait, so you're saying that when you moved to the Twin Cities at age 36, okay, you're, you're going ahead and going to do it for me. Yep. But 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 still, I found I found that interesting that at age 36, you found a, a step, a, a maturation step in your life. And, yeah. And the move sort of facilitated that. Yeah. I feel like I'm getting there too. Um, you know, I had I had you over for your uh for dinner last night and you know, me and Dell are trying to figure out how to cook and you know, slowly, you know, trying getting... to figure out. I thought you guys did great. Well, but you know, all of the other, you know, I texted you uh last week and said that you inspire my adulting, you know, like <laughs> getting on the getting on the path toward, you know, home ownership for us one day and sure. you know, who knows, maybe we will want to um you know, adopt a kid someday or whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of, you know, all of that just to outline what people, what artists have to think about when they're thinking about their future and and um, and and how their work as an artist plays into that. So I say shout out to everyone out there doing it full time. Shout out to everyone out there doing it part time. Shout out to everybody trying to make it. You know, they're, they're to everyone artists everywhere to everyone who moved away from everything familiar and everything yep. that they loved keep doing it it's it's going to pay off and and with all of the stories out there to uh, explore on this topic it was great to uh dive into pete's story so here it is peter collin the artist formerly known as Petey. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for sitting with me oh man you know it so um you know we're here in new york in my very nondescript hotel room where you uh work as a lawyer but i want to build up to this 
um, to this moment. Sure. So the first time I heard about you, you were one of these legends oh, of, God, nah. of the of the West Tennessee Honor Band circuit. You know, you were the kid with perfect pitch. Yeah. You were the one always making all state and doing all this. Was that was that sort of a burden or a challenge or maybe an honor for you to have that reputation as a high schooler? You know, so I blame it on my mother because. She was an all-West, all-State musician and put that on me. An instrumentalist. Uh, and vocalist. She played bass clarinet, oboe, and was an alto. I love when people play bass clarinet. Oh, you know it. <laughs> hey, they got those seats <laughs> in the honor bands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that was, that was me coming up. You know, both my parents were musicians, and they pushed me, and they said, be, excel, achieve. So, yeah, you get on these honor band circuits, and they're as competitive as AAU or any sort of sports team. And you know those... Uh, those auditions were cutthroat, and uh, I was proud of myself. I was feeling myself as a high schooler to be the the next young up and coming trombone player. I, did, did did you feel like those? Um, because you know auditions are something that most people just a musical audition in the way that we know it is something that most people will never have to deal with. Absolutely. And you know the stre- when I think about the stress of that audition as a tenth grader or an eleventh grader, really trying to make it into this honor band, uh, was. For me, it was on. If I'm going to be completely honest, it was more about making sure I got in the band. Absolutely. But for you, it seems like there had to have been more of a musical attachment to that experience. Um. So coming up, there was a few of us that were always in contention for those top chairs, and especially in high school, there was me and this other guy, a guy named Ben Easley, who's a great music teacher out in Nashville. Shout out to Ben. Shout out to Ben. Uh, and uh, he was always first chair always first chair and I was always trying to just get that first chair trying to unseat him and I was always second always second so uh, a little bit of a West Tennessee rivalry just pushing each other or, or, or just meet trying to meet that standard and, and just working for it uh, but you know the auditions they were absolutely stressful uh, you but you know that competitive fire it just fuels you and as our uh, as our mutual friend Andre Fagan used to say preparation relieves pressure. So the artist just, formerly known as Tony. Absolutely. <laughs> T. Andre Fagan. Um, shout outs to him conducting all over the world. Yeah. Uh, Where is he now, by the way? You know, he is a somewhere woman. in Texas, I think. So he did. He went to North Texas for his doctorate in Denton and then finished up at Arizona. And I want to say he ended up, so he's, I mean, if you don't know Andre Fagan, he is one of the, America's greatest young classical conductors. Absolutely. And, um, and one of the and one of the champions of band, music. absolutely, yeah. and just contemporary classical music for the wind ensemble. And I believe he is teaching. He's 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 a teacher first and foremost. And I believe he's teaching at a college in South Carolina. But I know he also has a permanent residency in in I think Malaysia or somewhere like that. Yeah, he's global. But he said that preparation relieves pressure, and you just you know, the, the truer words have never been spoken. You go in having played your. Uh, David Concerto or the Saint Song Cavatine and you're ready to rock and roll at because you've done it a million times. Yeah, yeah. And that's really what it takes. And, um, and I think that's what goes missing with so many young musicians and, and even the professionals. It's just repetition is a real thing. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it's no different than sports. I mean, how many times do you see uh, Penny Hardaway or Kevin Durant talking about doing drills over and over again, running the same play over and over again. Uh, it's not practice till you get it right. It's practice till you can't do it wrong. So that when the nerves kick in, uh, you just go on autopilot, you go on default. Uh, absolutely, I, I talk to that about. I talk to my students about that still to this day. So um, you and I first met when I got a gig teaching band camp at. Your alma mater, your high school alma Absolutely. mater, and you, uh, and and you came back to you know give back to your community and uh, your high school and all that. Sort of uh, paint the picture. Talk to me about Munford, Tennessee. So it's not quite Memphis. It's, it's not, and it's not quite a suburb of Memphis either. It's changed. So I was, and truthfully, I was born in Memphis, and and, and I am the product of city kids. My dad's a Brooklyn boy, uh, but my mother's family had for a long time had farmland in Munford, which originally had been a rural community, and then in the 80s had become sort of a bedroom suburb to Memphis. And after my youth, uh, having lived in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, and having spent time in Malvern, New York, uh, my dad and, and uh, my family sort of had sort of set roots down in my mother's hometown of Munford. And that's where I spent 
my adolescence. And Munford, uh, the high school, was sort of the center of life. It's sort of that prototypical uh, suburban middle America lifestyle. Oh, where on the, Friday nights, everyone was at the football game. Everybody was at the football game. But the, see, the thing, the football game, the football team was zero and ten. They were lousy. They were terrible. But the band. But the band. <laughs> uh, and I think we've talked about this uh, off mic with uh, folks in the HBCU culture and the battle of the bands and how the, the fifth quarter and how the band was this sort of centerpiece. And here we were at this uh, admittedly predominantly white high school where the band was part of the Bands of America, U- U.S. Bands Association, that sort of competitive marching band world where while the football team's Pad Nels, the band is going regionally, nationally, and winning competitions after competitions. And that competitive, cutthroat, high-stakes musical experience was my formative years. And that culture still persists today in Munford. And I'm very proud to say that I graduated from that school, came through that band program like my mother before me, uh, and then ended up going to college at Tennessee Tech and then Memphis for music and getting to teach there and, and pass that culture on. And it still is there to this day. If you Google that band, they've won national championships. They've marched in Macy's. They've marched in Tournament of Roses. My kindergarten music teacher, Gary Fight, to this day is still a band director Shout at that school. Gary. Shout out to He's Gary. He's a G. He's a real G. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> um, Gary and uh, Barry Trovon, Doug Young, still the teachers there. And so here you have this community of 5,000 people whose uh, biggest claim to fame is being where Justin Timberlake's grandfather went to high school or putting people in, in minor league, major league baseball. And yet they have this band, this 200 member marching band that performs at, at the top of high school competitive marching musical arts and is really the sort of foundational piece of an entire community. You know, we we talk so often about these schools that um, cut the music and cut the arts programming and it sounds like to me that the um, the fact that music and the arts was prioritized at Mumford High School uh, informed a lot of of uh, the the way you view music and the reasons why you went into it post high school. I mean, look, that's absolutely true, and and I say I say that having been the product of uh, two parents who are musicians, so so many of my friends whose parents weren't musically inclined uh, benefited and had these incredible life skills, life lessons, uh, entire trajectories altered because of a well-supported, impactful, public school music program that absolutely taught you your major scales, but taught you fundamental life skills, that taught you uh, preparation, that taught you discipline, diligence, focus. Uh, You know, I've had this conversation with other people to this day. I think the single best thing that could have happened to me and so many of my friends from all walks of life. I'm talking blue collar, poor to the poor, to people whose parents were in the banking business, uh, was to be part of a rigorous public school music program. That it really is the pressure that turns carbon into diamonds. One of the things I loved about teaching um, band camp at Mumford is because, you know, no shade to anybody, but you could tell who, which students came from background A and which students came from background one. Absolutely. And none of that mattered on the on that blacktop and, and on that uh, football field because it wasn't about any individual. It was about the whole. And 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 we don't talk about that enough today. We, we think so much about self. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you have to, even in music to an extent. But, sure. you know, that, that culture of being a part of something that is bigger than you is is you know priceless you know i i think about the the mumford high school band chants or i don't know if that's what oh, you yeah call pride it. drills yeah the pride drill you know are you proud uh-huh. you know yes you're you're proud of what you're a part of and man there's there's so much that could be said about that alone you know because it was bigger than any one person it you were carrying your school, your community, at some point, your entire region when you're going on the national stage. Right, because when the Mumford High School Band marched the Macy's Day Parade, you weren't just representing the Mumford High School Band, you were representing Mumford, Tennessee. West Tennessee. And, you know, for folks who, you know... The South, for some people. For your, for those of you who are Minnesotans, you know, uh, West Tennessee is not Nashville. This is blue collar. This is a place, um, <laughs> you know, that's that's full of poverty, that, that is mm-hmm. typically... Um, 
and I don't laugh at that, no, but no, just no. thinking about how unfamiliar some people can be. This is this is a far cry Tennessee. from Eaton Prairie, y'all. Yeah. This is this is a place where it's a, a lot of there's a lot of minority majority cities. There's a lot of people for whom forty thousand dollars is a live rich. high on the hog. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, so to be part of something, I mean, there are people who I went to school with who to this day say that's their that's the biggest thing they've ever been a part of in their lives. That's that's the highest they've flown <laughs> that, to the that's sun. Heart, that's heartbreaking a little bit. But, but how also, great is it that a music program great. gives that to people? Yeah. You know, it's a, it's just a band program. The same thing that maybe for you was a dalliance, was a nice distraction or a, a good thing to put on your college application. Uh, for so many people where I'm coming from, this is a way to pull yourselves up, to give yourself skills to actually be an adult. Uh, you know, we need more of those. And in Munford, it, to this day, it serves such a vital purpose. Shout out to Munford, Tennessee. Shout out to Munford. And, you know, it's not just in the concert hall. It's this whole concept of marching band, this outdoor performance ensemble, bringing this you know convention of highbrow classical music to sports crowds and people who otherwise are never going to set foot in the concert hall. Yeah, yeah. And they were cheering for the band Absolutely. just as much. You know, you know, even if they didn't know the... That outside music. No, is what I mean, you know, it. you're playing this this show that's quoting Aaron Copeland or quoting Stravinsky, and you've got, you know, Bubba, who's the plumber that fixed the toilet a couple of days ago, just going nuts over it. Shout out to Bubba. Shouts to Bubba. <laughs> so, uh, so with this very rich background and foundation, you made the, you know, the decision to leave Memphis, me yeah. leave the Memphis area, and go to Tennessee Tech. Um, why? Why, why was that a decision for you? So why there were a few things that? happening. I mean, Memphis was very much a part of my DNA. So many great memories, great teachers, great musical moments. It's one of, I think, one of the great music cities in America. Uh, but as I was looking at schools, I wanted to spread my wings. I knew there was more to life than just my immediate comfort zone. And in Tennessee Tech, which for, for many people who do know, is this sort of unique quasi-conservatory environment in in the greater Nashville area. I mean, you've got a tuba ensemble that's played Carnegie Hall seven, eight times that's on Grammy nomination lists. And so uh, the trombone professor that that I connected with, we connected very well, both as he was of the classical world, but also played with widespread panic and played jazz. And the conductor, the director of bands, was the sort of conductor, Joseph Herman, who, who really was the kind of conductor I wanted to emulate because it wasn't about him. It wasn't about showy gestures and fanfare on the podium. It was about you being a conduit to the composer's voice and getting the most out of your ensemble. And for me <laughs> as a musician... So I, I, I laugh. I laugh oh, thinking you, about all of the challenges I've had oh, with conductors over the years. Some of and, which we've shared. <laughs> and, you, and you're describing the opposite. Ain't that the truth. No, Joseph Herman was, uh, was the kind of conductor that everybody wishes they could be. And it's proximity to Nashville. I was in a band with uh, an artist named Chris Love, and shout out to Chris. Shout out Love. to Chris, and we were part of the. We were we had tackled Memphis and were uh, cutting records and making our way into Nashville. And I was doing some recording in studios in Nashville. It just was the sensible time for me to, to as an eighteen year old who who really was feeling himself as a trombone player and and, and musician, to uh, to sort of push into the greater industry. But uh, it ultimately was short-lived, the Nashville industry and, and that world. It was great, great musical training, great experiences, uh, but my musical truth was so in, just so informed by Memphis that after a couple of years, I came back to the University of Memphis and was, and was very grateful for both experiences. Now, before, <laughs> I, I almost don't want to tell this story, but before you came back to the University of Memphis, uh -oh. you invited, yeah, go ahead and take a drink. Uh -huh. You uh, you invited me to um, what was described as a slip and slosh. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We, we, were, we, we were all young at, at some point, so it's fine. Absolutely. But, you know, let, let's, let's just say that I think the both of us had our fill. You know what? And some. <laughs> no, if, if you're in college, make friends with the musicians. Yeah. Because they know what's up. <laughs> and, you know, uh, 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 some weeks ago I talked, and you listened to my interview with Marion. I did. He, he talked about that exact thing, how the band kids in college were the ones who were really drinking the alcohol. Oh and, I mean, and, you know, not to tell XYZ. tales on myself. So in fairness, I was in Kappa Kappa Psi fraternity, KK Psi, uh, which is a dry fraternity. 
But outside of those activities, I mean, we're musicians and we're young and we're in, you know, one of the great cities in America. Um, I mean, we were wilding out and we were living it when we were doing it. <laughs> so did you feel like your transition from Tennessee Tech to the University of Memphis was, was big? Was there, was there a learning curve? Did you feel like one university prepped you more than the other? I'm very grateful because I feel like the foundational music training that I got at, at Tennessee, Tennessee Tech, uh, in form and analysis, in harmony, in theory, in music history, in uh, recording technology, Pro Tools, was a great grounding point in fundamentals. It was like basketball. I, I learned how to uh, defend the zone, and I learned how to dribble and do crossovers. And then I get to University of Memphis where the emphasis is about, okay, you've got this training. Now delve deeper into artistry. Delve deeper into musicianship. It's your dribbling in time. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now run these plays that are going to be able to penetrate the zone, that are going to be able to get uh, maximum offense You know, in a musical sense. You know, when I get to, mu- to the University of Memphis, it is so much about you know, how can we be innovative? How can we really push the musical envelope? How can we take classical music convention and traditions and do things with them that haven't been done before that reach people that otherwise wouldn't be reached so i feel like i really timed college music training right because i get to university of memphis and i'm working with i mean amazing musicians like john mueller craig williams albert Wynn, nick holland andre fagan all these guys uh garrett mcqueen and we're sitting here really making something with emotional richness with musical content you know, Tennessee Tech, it's all about standard literature. When I'm playing all the marches, all the Henry Fillmore's and the Carl Kings and all the war horse literature by you know, John Barnes Chance or Vince Persichetti. And then I get to the University of Memphis and it's like, that's great training. That's great grounding. Now, here's David Maslanka. Here's yep. John Mackey's latest work. Here's uh, Stephen Bryant. Here's Eric Whitaker. All these uh, American composers, contemporary living composers on the vanguard of music, not just wind band music or classical music, but truly on the vanguard of music. Uh, so those would be the differences is, is at, at Tennessee Tech, not that it's not contemporary, because they certainly are and have John Mackey and all these guys come through their programs, but they were so good about giving me the fundamentals that when I went to the University of Memphis, I had this great foundation to really push myself artistically. I actually don't remember. Were you a, a trombone performance major or music I was, or what? I was a music education major, again. Back to Gary Fight. I had all these great examples from five years old. Gary Fight, John Kerr, Stephen Womack, all these musicians uh, who were great musicians and just so in tune with that culture who spent their days teaching, teaching kids, teaching kids how to finger F sharp and, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, when to raise the third of a chord yeah. and who was uh, Felix Mendelssohn. And so that example and, and, the, and the value that they had on my life, I said, you know what, that means something. So I absolutely had dreams of performance and wanted to perform, uh, but never not wanted to teach. And even if I was on the road or performing or part or signed to a label or anything like that, I wanted to be able to teach kids. Yeah. And, and I talk about it all the time, how I... Um you know, most of my undergraduate career was as a music ed major. Absolutely. But when it came to that practicum, I went into that middle school classroom, and I just knew that just was not it. <laughs> <laughs> and see, I went into a, you know, colonial middle school, and I'm sitting here screwing around with the kids and joking with them and talking about, you know, I, you know, this is like 2007, 2008. So whatever was popular back then, you know, Wheezy's just coming out on the scene, yeah. and you know. Uh, LeBron is still there, and Bonzi Wells is still playing for the Memphis Grizzlies. So you're having that sort of cultural interaction and building equity with the kids. So then you sort of then open their eyes up to the discoveries that my teachers opened up to me in the context of music. And there's just such a shared exchange there that was just so enriching for for me and my soul. But and before we go uh, further on your journey, I want to pull over for a second. You you've mentioned sports a lot, absolutely, and uh, and I'm sure there you know are a plethora of of metaphors there. You know, our our the conductor we both worked under, Craig Williams, actually suggested that we all read the book about tennis. I forget the title, the inner game of tennis. Yeah, and and how that's great for musicians. It really, I did. I read it, and it was great. To, to, to what extent um, 
you know, was sports a, a formative part of your music education? So Memphis is such a sports town. I mean, it's Hoop City. There's so much basketball tradition that even though I was not the greatest of athletes, like I played some basketball in fifth grade, but... Uh, you were hooping? You were dunking on I was absolutely not dunking. <laughs> I was not hooping at all. I belong on that bench, no doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, when you're talking to kids, when you're talking to kids for whom the class and classical music is a barrier, what can you get to... to what get connection them? can exactly. be made? Exactly. Yeah. How do you get them to buy in? So metaphors, and there's so, I feel like the comparisons to sports and music are so natural. Um, what athletes have to do is exactly the same from a mental standpoint of what musicians have to do. So that connection is, I mean, it's just so easy. And yeah. so for non-musicians, it's been a great way, it's been a great entryway for me to get them to come in and talk music. It's like, you know, LeBron is a is a principal player. There is no doubt about and, that. <laughs> and, you know, the other players take on some of the secondary roles, uh -huh. you know, just the same as an orchestra or, or any, you know, I, I worked for five seasons as a second, a professional second bassoonist, there you, you go. know, so it, it, it takes all sorts and. Uh, I, I've often um, actually struggled with making connections between sports and music because that's not my expertise, but it's it's really good to hear an informed uh, opinion. You know, <laughs> I, the collaboration that a basketball team has to have on the floor is not all that different from the collaboration that you find sitting in a section or sitting in an ensemble. Absolutely. And I'm sure that can be translated into you know, working on an assembly line or being a part of I mean, any anything. Team. I mean, as you as you know, I, I still currently teach for Jazz at Lincoln Center here in New York. And while this is not the area that I teach, they have uh, instructional seminars for the corporate world, the C-suite, the business personnel, where they come in and listen and watch a jazz combo and the collaboration and the communication that happens from that as a way for them to then go into their corporate settings and be better at their jobs and yeah. pull those strategies to be more efficient and maximize output because it's absolutely a transfers. Music makes you smarter. Ain't that the Period. truth? Period. So you graduate from um, University of Memphis with a music education degree. I do. You did not go into music education. Well, I did well, for five well, years. For, for some time. Oh, I actually forgot that you went back to Mumford High School. And that's a story oh, in wow, itself. I forgot about That's incredible. So I was all set. I graduated from the University of Memphis, and my plan was to go and be the assistant band director at a school about a mile from my apartment in Memphis, a, a creative and performing arts school in Memphis called Watkins Overton High School. Again, we mentioned Andre Fagan. Watkins over he had, uh, he had He was going to do his doctorate, and I had been part of the instructional staff there while he was teaching there as a teacher. Uh, and so I, the track was that I was going to be the assistant band director, and our good friend Justin Johnson was going to take the head yeah, director. Shout out to Justin. Uh, Justin ends up getting a great job in Chicago. Uh, the job there in Overton doesn't quite pan out, and uh, lo and behold, there was a position that comes open at my alma mater in Munford in, in, in this sort of very different educational setting than this creative and performing arts high school in Overton. I mean, this is a Title I school. There's a lot of, there's a lot more musical challenges there where maybe 1% of the faculty, of the students even took private lessons. Yeah. But it was home. It was my roots. I mean, my grandfather was a principal there. So uh, there was a sort of a sense of duty when the job comes open. Absolutely. Let's, let's build that up. Let's and naturally there's a connection you can have with those students as someone who came up through that exact program. Exactly. Exactly. So I did. I taught there, right? I was uh, the choir director and assistant band director working alongside my very first public school music teacher in kindergarten and my high school band director. Yeah. Did, did, you, did, you, did you feel that there was um, a learning curve for you as a choir director, someone yes. who was trained as a wind uh, musician? Absolutely. So in fairness, I had sung in undergrad. I, I love to sing. I well, enjoy as, singing. As my beginning band director once said, shout out to Ron Turner. What's up, Ron All Turner? musicians sing. Some of them play instruments. There you go. <laughs> there you go. But to teach choir, to teach the physics of making a good sound mm -hmm. with the voice, yeah. certainly very different. And, and in fairness, not something I was pedagogically equipped to do coming in. But that was the job. And so you learn and you just take the job and you dive in and you build something. And, you know, uh, I certainly made my mistakes along the way, as all teachers do. 
Uh, but in the five years that I was there, we went from a program that had maybe 60 kids to a program that had 160 kids, a program that had the advanced choir singing in Carnegie Hall and doing um, uh, concerts with guest professional opera singers as guest residents. Uh, so we were able to build something. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, there have been two choir directors since I left, and the current choir director, shouts to Doug Young, uh, not only has continued that tradition, but even built it up from there. So uh, I'm very proud to have gone and, and contributed something that continues to be a positive impact in music education. I wonder what are some of the um, biggest things you had to kind of teach yourself on the job as far as being a choir director? I mean, the physics of making uh, Just good te- sound teaching on the kids voice. about the diaphragm. Absolutely, and, yeah. and the soft palate, and how to, uh, the physics of creating a characteristic sound as a 14-year-old before your voice has changed compared to as an 18-year-old after your voice has changed. Uh, and just the physics of singing are so much different than for me as a trombone player. Some of it's very similar, uh, but some of it was quite different. And the then, voice has more than seven positions. Yeah, uh, that is <laughs> that is true. Oh boy, that's true. And the smallest little thing affects it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just uh, for whatever reason, your average ninth grade choir student has different musical uh, tool, a different musical toolkit than your average ninth grade instrumental student. Uh, they have a more developed sense of ear, but maybe not as much of a developed sense of rhythm. So hmm. reading, notation, these are things that uh, I struggled with in my early years. Uh, and as, a, as an instrumentalist, they were my bread and butter. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you just jump in. I mean, it's something that I continue to do here in my current world as a technology lawyer consultant type professional is, you know, as new things pop up, you just jump in. Uh, and, and, and embrace the unknown and really grab for it. But uh, I, I certainly was not prepared to be a choir director, but I learned. And, and, and you had a lot of success in it, you know? Well, I, I'm grateful because uh, the kids were so hardworking. Say what you want about, uh, you know, the kids that I had at Munford. Maybe they're not taking private lessons. Maybe their parents didn't have uh, Ivy League education, but they worked so hard. You know, Dwayne Johnson says he always wants to be the hardest worker in the room. And that was the mentality that my kids took. They were coming before before school, staying after school for hours, working with practice tracks and working with me and working with uh, people that I'd bring in or working together. They just worked so hard because they really wanted to be good. And when you're motivated to be good, uh, amazing things just can't not happen. Um, but before we uh, before we move beyond your career as a choir director and assistant band director, is there a, a piece of choral music that um, that just stands out to you, or one that you feel like people should know, people should think about? There are a few. So when I was in high school, the first proper classical choir music piece that I ever got to do was Beethoven's Choral Fantasy. Oh, yeah. Grosse Stanz and Erska Drunga. I mean, like, it's just so... Like the precursor to the Ninth Symphony, and which I do sort, love. And that's sort of all hands on deck because really there's choir, is. there's orchestra, there's a pianist. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. You're, it, it, that is that... Remember in elementary school when you've got that eight-pack of crayons and then that kid across the table's got, got the like... 64 a, pack. Oh, oh, like the 98-pack. <laughs> like, so the Choral Fantasy is that big old pack of crayons. Yeah. And to hear that as a, as a teenager when your musical mind is so open and so formative... That piece was a a big influence and and had such an impact on me. Uh, Other than that, you know, there's choir music by uh, Eric Whitaker, The Seal Lullaby, which I think was just so beautiful, and I was grateful to do it with my kids. His entire catalog is... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil I got to do with my kids, and that was just so... Uh, just so fantastic. Is we that the one that goes all night long? Close. Close. <laughs> not, it's the Russian not. version. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we got to do it here in New York. Uh, there's a church um, not far from where we're recording that one of my uh, great uncles had been an Episcopal rector. And I got to take my kids to sing it in there. And just listening oh, wow. to it uh, reverberate in that space was you, beautiful. You took kids from, because uh, I know the Mumford High School Band March and the Macy's Day Parade, but you took choir students to sing in, in this church. Absolutely. In wow. 2013, the same group that got to perform in Carnegie, we booked a couple other concerts along the way. Um, Those and, are experiences they will never forget. Uh, I mean, I certainly never will forget. Uh, you know, one of the other things we did is we went to uh, Strawberry Fields in Central Park and did Because, uh, the 
the Beatles choir masterpiece from their Abbey Road album. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge, in addition to being a, a grown and trained in Memphis blues and soul, B.B. King, Sam and Dave, my dad, before he was a, a musician at Berklee School of Music, was a, a Beatles nut. So my musical bread and butter is the Beatles and their, master, their, their mastery of harmony and their embrace of classical music in the pop sense. So I absolutely getting to do that with kids and, and do it here in a Beatley place. That's maybe uh, a, a, maybe sort of an overlooked piece of choral vocal music that I absolutely uh, just found so rich. So despite all of your incredible experiences um, as this choir and assistant band director, you decided to move on. I did. So there's a blessing and a curse that comes with the life that I had chosen in my early tw- and mid-20s. Uh, to be someone in my mid-20s living... Uh, in the same sort of town where I'd gone to high school, working with the same people that had taught me in high school, to be one of the few teachers that was under 40 and single. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it was a challenge. It was a challenge on me personally. And to have a music program of this nature, where the kids aren't, they just can't take private lessons, the band directors and the choir directors, all of us, gave so much more of our time, willfully, gladly, but when you're coming to school at 6.45 a.m. in the morning and some nights leaving at 5 p.m., 7 p.m., or on weekends, you get home after a Friday night football game at midnight only to be at school again 7 a.m. to take the kids to a band contest on the other end of the state so that you don't get home until 4 a.m. the next morning. Then you come back to the school on Sunday to prep for the next day. Uh, you know, Not I, to mention the, you know, I, I hate to put Mumford, Tennessee out there, but not to mention the cultural aspects of the job. I remember you talking about signing a, um, a morality clause and you yes. know, it, it's sort of being unseemly for you to be seen in the liquor store, uh, that sort of thing. You know, absolutely. Munford is in a very evangelical Christian part of the country, and I have many relatives for whom that is true. Shout out to the evangelicals. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Holla and praise. Um, but coming from someone with a bit of a multi-religious background uh, and just my own my own uh, maybe stereotypically millennial view on things, uh, that life works for a lot of people. And I, but it didn't work for it you. It did not work for me. I wanted to have a bit more adventure. I wanted to be able to uh, be part of a single scene. There was not much of a single scene when I was teaching. Um, uh, I wanted to have adventures. And w- no disrespect to Munford, but... The time that was required of me to to be part of this uh, music program left me uh, imbalanced. We talk about work-life balance all the time in, in different places. And my work-life balance was very out of whack. And having worked in, some, you know, in, in a finance startup and for a broker-dealer and in law firms and all that, I to this day have never worked as hard, as many hours, as mentally grueling as it was to be a public school teacher. Was there something that attracted you to the, the world of law? I mean, why, why not try and go be a music teacher somewhere else? I thought about that and was contemplating doing that. But, you know, when you're a music teacher in, your, in, in the Memphis area, your world, your home, you know, it, it's tough to then go to Centennial, Tennessee or Paragould, Arkansas in this whole other place where the challenges haven't changed and the positives are are shrinking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had an uncle who had tried to make it as an actor and then ended up going to law school in Boston uh, that ended up doing very well for himself, as well as another uncle who had gone to law school in New York City and done, again, very well for himself. And while law certainly brings stress, they financially were uh, doing much better than I was able to do as a teacher uh, they could go to the bathroom whenever they want. They didn't have someone have to come, someone come watch the law firm while well, I have to have someone come watch the kids. Yeah, watch the clients while I go to the exactly. bathroom. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and to be a musician and sort of the hustle, the grind, the interpersonal aspects of it, the, uh, the as well as the, the policy and legal aspects that just permeate so much of public education, there were a lot of natural extensions for the work as a musician and the work as a music teacher uh, that, that give you uh, advantages in law school and in the law. So I did. I ended up, after five years of teaching, I had applied to my uncle's alma mater, Northeastern University in Boston. Very grateful that I got in. And it was a tough decision. You know, I agonized over it for, for weeks. 
uh, but decided I was 27, you know, take this risk. Go for it. Who cares what people think? It's your life. Have an adventure, why don't you? And so ended up bailing on the relatively safe career of music to this uh, unpredictable, wild career of law school uh, and, and left my, my, uh, my teaching job and my pit orchestra job because I was also playing nights at a mm-hmm. theater Memphis pit orchestra. Yeah, you were, yeah. Um, and ended up going to law school in, in Boston, somewhere I'd never lived. I'm a Yankees fan, so certainly was not, <laughs> not thrilled about going to Boston in that respect. But uh, in hindsight... It was absolutely the right move. So you graduated and you decided to um, take the New York bar. I did. Why? Uh, So my grandparents, again, I I have such fond memories of uh, being here as a kid and going to my grandparents' house in Long Island. Uh, You know, my sister and I had uh, an apartment here in Queens, in Astoria. During law school, I'd interned at a few different firms in New York and at the end of my law school career had clerked in the legal department for Jazz at Lincoln Center, uh, which is a wonderful nonprofit that you know, promotes jazz and, yeah. and not just jazz, but just promotes music uh, at all at all aspects. And was fortunate to before I even got a law job out of law school, got a weekend job teaching their middle school jazz academy in the Bronx, uh, and then took the New York bar. I knew I was going to be here. Knew I wanted to be here close to family in a city that was more in keeping with me and my sensibilities and 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 what I wanted to, where I wanted to see myself. Uh, and ended up getting a job here as well in uh, Thomson Reuters from the great uh, global company, but certainly based in Egan, Minnesota, uh, who has an entire legal division and ended up getting a job in their legal space. Not necessarily practicing law in the traditional sense, but being the sort of hybrid lawyer and technology consultant, which uh, having done some tech work when I was a musician, and the, the technology has revolutionized the music industry as, as it has with every industry. Uh, they saw all these skills and said, okay, you you have some, some things that we want. And so the jobs came calling in New York, passed the bar here, and, and uh, it's, been, it's been two years now almost since I, since I took that step. And you've mentioned uh, Lincoln Center a few times. You know, you, so in addition to being a lawyer, you, you know, you're still connected to music. You, yeah, you teach I, you, over there. i, I got to be true to myself. I yeah. mean, at the end of the day, I'm still that, that eight-year-old who's just... You know, transformed when you hear Sam and Dave come on the radio. Uh, I, even and I, I've had this conversation with a lot. There's a lot of lawyers, people I went to law school with, who are musicians at heart. And so, if you have that passion, even if it's not uh, what you what you rely on to pay for rent, uh, that doesn't mean you're not a musician. And so, absolutely, I'm very proud to be part of Jazz Lincoln Center and to and to have this sort of non-music nine to five uh but at the same time still get to uh to be to be part of the musical community and 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 fulfill that side of myself what would you say to the person who's looking to embark on a music career but has a lot of possibilities in front of them at the same time yeah uh, so because certainly you i mean You've stuck to the course in a way because a way. you're still teaching, but it's just it's, not your primary it's not gig. Not my primary. Uh, I I would say that you know, Winston Morris, who was the tuba professor at Tennessee Tech, who's a legend. Again, Carnegie Hall, all the all the accolades, had this sign outside of his office, and I, I'm paraphrasing it, but basically, the quote was: "The music business is a cold and dangerous place, you know, a labyrinth where." Uh, pimps and whores run free and good men die like dogs. And there's also a negative side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a gauntlet. Yeah. It, to be a professional working musician, especially in the 21st century, when uh, people would rather hire a DJ than a seven-piece band, yeah. um, the opportunities for musicians are not what they were uh, when our heroes were out there making music, especially in the classical and jazz and blues music space. Uh, so to the person that's got the talent, uh, I would say it's a, it's a grind. It's a hustle. You gotta be, you gotta be driven. It's gotta com- consume you because again, I look at my, uh, my father who, um, was a great guitar player and ended up going to Berkeley school of music when they went to great jazz schools in Boston, uh, and ended up, uh, going from being a jazz guitarist and booking jazz bands like the Crusaders and the Gary Burton Quartet into a career in finance and technology because 
it is so personally stressful and so unpredictable uh, a lifestyle and a revenue stream for your own support and success that um, if you're not willing to take that sort of uh, just all the stress and all the uh, unpredictability that comes with it, uh, I would say to very carefully weigh your options. In fact, one of the things that I remember talking about with my choir students in high school, I had sort of said, all right, here are the 10 things, the 10 do's and don'ts about going to be a, a college student, not just a music major, but a college student that I wish people had told me. Uh, and one of my do's was do take an internship outside of your major. Hmm. Because when I was an undergrad, I had worked for Vining Sparks, who's a broker dealer in the uh, the bond market, you know, SBA bonds, municipal bonds, uh, where I got some, some knowledge besides music. Uh, I met some great musicians there. I met some people that were part of, uh, you know, the Beale Street Merchants Association and people who are very connected to music. There's musicians all over the place. They may not be musicians like all the time, but they're everywhere. And so you made these connections and you built these relationships that I ended up using as a musician and as a not musician. Um, but I would say that just because music is your passion and music is your talent, uh, because so you know when you're sitting there in an apartment in 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 Spotswood and you know in South Memphis and Orange Mound where you're trying to figure out how do I pay rent how do I pay for food mm -hmm. and I haven't gotten enough gigs lately um, that's real that stress is real that heartache is real is that something that you're going to be prepared to handle when you're 19 versus when you're 29 versus when you're 59 yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that answer for me was very different from, you know, some of the other people that I'm, that I'm tight with. And so you just got to know yourself and, and be prepared. But fortunately, I had these great musical experiences and these great non-musical experiences that at least gave me flexibility. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that, that, that leads me a lot to think about because, you know, I transitioned from, you know, the stage to uh, the radio, you know, for, for slightly different reasons. But I, I agree with what you say as far as, you know, the stresses of it are indeed very real. Um, not to say that there isn't a rewarding side of it. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. I've, so someone asked me a few months ago to compare... My, my current life, having passed the bar and working for a global company that's very not musical, uh, to when I was teaching. And the answer I told him is, you know, the highs are certainly not as high, but the lows are not as low. Yeah. Uh, there is no greater adrenaline rush than to be in an orchestra and you, as a trombone player, you get to the fourth movement of Beethoven's fifth. Um, but there's, again, no greater low than... You lost that audition, and now you have to decide, do I pay rent or do I buy groceries? Yeah, yeah, or do I pay my utilities, or mm -hmm. do I, you know, um, yeah, but, 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 but all of that's great, and it's, it's so phenomenal that you've been able to uh, form yourself um, financially in the world of law as well as still have an arm in music, and, and I, I remember you telling me once that you uh, actually saw Wynton Marcellus uh, in the men's room, in passing. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. So I mean, you know, even though I, just as a law clerk at Jazz and Lincoln Center, and now as a teacher, I mean, I'm grateful. You know, you still get to interact with people. I mean, just the other day, we took the kids to a Jazz for Young People's concert, and the fit focus was uh, who is Miles Davis. And I'm backstage, uh, changing clothes because I've been teaching, and I want to put something nicer on. And who do I see walking by but Jimmy Cobb, who was the drummer yeah. for. Miles Davis right. on Kind of Blue, and I'm going, yeah. oh my God. You know, these are just incredible experiences that, I, you know, just because I'm not a musician, just because my paycheck isn't reliant on me being a musician all the time, uh, that doesn't close me off from having just incredible musical experiences. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sitting with me, Pete. It's Anytime. always a pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, Garrett. I mean, you certainly, I, I love listening to you and following you because, again, you're not just a bassoon player, but you're doing the radio thing and the podcast thing, and you write so much. Again, I feel like as mus not just as millennials, but as musicians, 
uh, we don't just have one hustle. And so uh, if, if there's any example of that, I mean, that's just kind of the way we are. And if anyone's good at doing that, it's people that, that, uh, that play music. And mu- music education certainly preps us for that. There's no doubt about that. All right. Until next time. Peter Cullen in conversation with Garrett McQueen here on Triloquy. This is Opus 6. There are musicians everywhere, as Pete said, even if they aren't musicians all the time, yeah. inc- including us. So we spent this opus, you know, talking with a, you know, music student turned music teacher, uh, turned lawyer and part-time music teacher. And I think next time we're actually going to um, get to talk to a student. I met some kids uh, this past winter um, on one of my school visits, and um, and they have some really interesting things to say. So I'm looking forward to, to sharing that for the next opus. Be on the listen to Triloquy, Opus 7, coming your way soon. Ciao. Bye. Bye.